I would like to welcome you to this magnificent panel about the total force and worldwide engagement. That without a doubt is a very important topic aligned to this year's theme, Accelerate and Innovate, actualizing the nation's need for dominant air and space forces. My name is Doug Rayberg. I'm the Air Force Association's Executive Vice President and honored to serve as your panel moderator. Joining me are the four pinnacle leaders of the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve. Generals, the last time we met, we talked about the threats facing our nation and global commons where we never expected our nation, both at home and abroad, would face the threat posed by a global pandemic. And yet now, less than a month back, we witnessed the largest domestic deployment since Hurricane Katrina of guardsmen to the national capital region for the presidential inauguration. Over 27,000 citizen airmen and soldiers and their equipment, a total force response while remaining fully committed to sustaining mission readiness and producing combat power in air, space, and cyber domains. We have a lot to talk about because in the end, it's all about people. Please welcome my guests. Lieutenant General Michael Lowe, Director of the Air National Guard. With him is Chief Master Sergeant Maurice Williams, Command Chief Master Sergeant of the Air National Guard. Lieutenant General Richard Scobie, Chief of the Air Force Reserve. And joining him is Chief Master Sergeant Timothy White, Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of the Air Force Reserve. General Lowe and Command Chief Williams, let's start with the Air National Guard. Would you both provide us some insights on the changing landscape of commitments and mission readiness that directly impacts our Air Guardsmen, their families, and employers? Over to you, gentlemen. Hey, uh, General Rayberg, uh, thanks again for having us. And to uh, my partner, Scobes there, great seeing you, even if it is via Zoom. And, and of course, to uh, Chief White, thanks for your leadership. And then my partner, you know, the uh, 13th Command Chief, uh, you know, Chief Master Sergeant Mo Williams, a true airman's airman. So thank you all for being here and thanks for AFA. I mean, really making this happen for us is great. Getting, uh, getting the message out of our airmen at this level is fantastic. So last time we talked, we talked about 2020 being the year of the guard with the COVID, with the unprecedented wildfires out in the West and the hurricanes down in the South. And of course the overseas deployments that are continually and ongoing. And, uh, and then the civil unrest in the summer. And so as the vaccine rollout happened, we saw 32,000 National Guard members on duty today doing COVID-19 vaccine operations, and that's today. And so 2021, we were, we were all set. This was gonna be a great year. And uh, Wednesday, January 6th, changed all that as we all watched in horror as the Capitol was overrun. And so what happens when something like that occurs? is Guard Nation comes together and you just gotta put yourself in an airman's shoes. And I'm gonna start with that. So on a Wednesday afternoon, as everybody was watching it on TV, there was a mobilization of the DC National Guard for an immediate response. So people dropped what they were doing and they reported to the armories and training centers. And they did what they did back in June, which was get ready for again, the riots that occurred. And so they grabbed their equipment and within a very few short hours, they were on the west side of the Capitol at the steps, airmen, soldiers, shoulder to shoulder with riot gear. As this mob didn't stop and they were on duty, the first shift was on duty to 0200 in the morning. And then they were replaced by the second shift. Now these people left their jobs, these people left their families and so, I'm gonna hand it over to, to uh, Chief Williams here to talk about what it takes to be ready in the National Guard and the reserves of today. But before I do that, it, it was a remarkable effort. We sourced over a core's worth of soldiers and airmen to the nation's capital, over 27,000. And we airlifted over a division so 7,700 airmen and soldiers to the nation's capital via, via National Guard airlift. Okay, and I, and I got some great total force stories and, and, I'll, and I'll end with that before I hand it over to Chief Williams. 
But when you think about the rampant Andrews at the time, and it was one uh, location, and when you think about the ramp of Andrews, Chief Williams and I went out there, saw the old C-130H, saw the new C-130J, C-17, KC-135, and then new to the fight was a KC-46. And, and I got to tell you, that KC-46, um, when they got the call up there in New Hampshire, they immediately mobilized, but they didn't have any troop seats. So who did they call? And Scobes doesn't even know the story because I haven't been able to pass it on. They called Seymour Johnson Reserves, and they said, come on, we'll take care of you. They go, they land down there. The reserves go into action, load up the back end of that airplane in order to move people, soldiers, all the cargo that was there. Uh, give them what the crew needs, pizza and caffeine. It is what it is. That's the way we operate, right? And then they went on to go fly, and they did that for three aircraft. They went on to go fly 47 missions with the KC-46. They were on the ground sometimes less than 45 minutes for a full onload and offload. And it was 47 code one sorties. No write-ups. They brought maintenance with them, never utilized. Now, that's a modernized Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve. Try that with the KC-135. Right. And so as we go into this, into these times, what does it mean to be ready? It's having the right equipment. But the airman pieces is huge. And Chief Williams and I have been out there at the Capitol and also been out there at the front lines of Andrews as they came in there. And so, Chief, I need to hand it over to you because you heard the firsthand stories as I did. And so what are your impressions on what it means to be ready in the guard today? Chief, over to you. Hey, sir, thanks for passing over to me. Uh... You know, as as you mentioned, uh, being prepared and ready is uh, is is paramount. Uh, so you take our airmen that we're, we're always training for that federal mission. But over the last year, we've been engaged in domestic operations. You got to think about a lot of individuals that have that diverse background. Uh, some are already uh, uh, essential personnel working in the medical facilities. We have some that are already in, in law enforcement. So they combine, combine those talents and skills together to go out there and meet the mission. And as we talk to the, we out there on the ground, talk to the individuals, say hey, they're excited about it because they're involved, they wanna help the community. Uh, you know, we have some that are a little torn between um, their civilian job and the military job because they're, like I say, essential workers. You know, I can tell you a story of, um, one uh, major that we met up in New Hampshire, she was a uh, healthcare professional within the hospital and she had been uh, there with patients. Uh, she said five patients had, had passed away that she was sitting there with. And uh, one of the patients was um, 80 something year low and her husband uh, had passed. And she called the lady uh, a week later to uh, talk with her. And she said one of the things she was, she started crying. She said she hadn't heard a human voice in over a week. And so that became her routine of calling her every week because of being there from that side. But in doing that, she went out to be at the COVID vaccination site, which gave her, helped her mentally because she was on the part of saving lives versus being there looking at death, uh, doing it at the hospital. So that's that diverse group we have. And even at those locations, we have people doing things out of their, out of their AFSC in logistics, and supply and keep the things going. So that diverse background helps us when it comes to performance and training uh, to always be ready uh, at, a, at the call of the nation. So, sir, I'll turn it back over to you. General Chief, thank you. Uh, it's for our audience. That was total joint, uh, joint reception, staging, onward movement of forces in the national capital region. And I think we just got a an incredible insight and I look forward to more of this conversation. Let me hand it over to General Scobie and Chief White. This has been an equally dynamic year for Air Force reservists. Would you give us your views on the state of the reserve force over the past year? Hey, sure. Thanks, uh, General Rayberg. I appreciate it, and uh, and I got to say hello to my fellow panelists, uh, and you know General Lowe and uh, and uh, Chief Williams. Just fantastic comments right out the gate. So I uh, appreciate you both. 
normally I would, I, I like to give Mike a hard time, but uh, after all those compliments, I'm just going to have to keep that to myself. But uh, it is great to be here. And it, virtual has its challenges, uh, as we all know, uh, because of the weather here in, in D.C. I'm, I'm stuck at home. Um, but and there are benefits and drawbacks to that. One of the drawbacks is, is uh, Janice is sitting right here to my right, and she keeps shaking her head like I'm do saying or doing something wrong, and I haven't even started speaking yet. So, uh, so <laughs> if, if you're at work, you're much luckier than me. I'm being judged on everything that I say. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, one of the things that I'm going to go right out the gate is, is is thanking you, General Rayberg. You know, with your leadership and especially with General Wright's leadership, every year we have been showcasing more and more of what the Air Reserve component, both what what the uh, Guard and the Air Force Reserve have been bringing uh, to the fight. Um, and this panel is a, is just a prime example of how you how you bring that up even more so every year. And I just want to say that I really appreciate it. The, the leadership that, that y'all have shown in AFA has just been uh, stalwart and we really appreciate it and that's great. Um, and I'm going to start with saying it, it's, it's my honor. You know, my, uh, my wingman, uh, Chief Mass Sergeant Tim, Tim White, um, could not ask for a better wingman in the things that I'm doing. It's, it's our honor to be able to represent 74,000 uh, citizen airmen that are in the Air Force Reserve, uh, great airmen, and, and they have been integrated into every mission set that the active component uh, does across the board. And there's nothing that we don't find ourselves in. And we're in so many of those mission sets that the active component uh, wants because uh, we require that surge uh, capacity. And, and really, in what mission set would you not want surge capacity in order to fight the wars that the American people need us to be able to fight? And so that re really becomes uh, something that's important to us. And then as we get into an era with uh, constrained budgets and uh, really looking at how we, uh, we build capacity and capability within our Air Force, it's gonna be very incumbent upon the, the Guard and Reserve to be able to, to uh, keep the capacity somewhere that we can use it. And, uh, and I think that's gonna pay huge dividends, literally and figuratively, uh, for us in the future as we go forward for our Air Force. And I'm, I'm pretty ex excited about that. But uh, that's what, what we do, we deliver uh, effective, agile, responsive airmen to fight the wars that we're gonna need to fight for America. And our, our airmen in the reserve are able to do that. That's 20% of the capacity for the entire Air Force, only 3% only of the Air Force budget. So that is what we, is our value statement as we go forward. And we're able to do that because we capitalize on investments the Air Force make, and we capitalize by being uh, tenant units on the majority of our places on uh, Air Force bases. That's how we do it. And, uh, and, and we also do it because we're predominantly a part-time force. 75% of our airmen are part-time. And, uh, and that's really great. And it's a partnership with not only our communities, but it's also a partnership with industry and with employers that allow their airmen to, to go off and serve and make it, uh, make it amicable for them to do that. And it works out really well. And we're able to do that with only 39 training days a year and stay on step with the readiness that's required. And not only that, but the combat capabilities required. And, uh, and that is something that is great for us. That's for sure. Chief. General Rayberg, uh, General Lowe, my wingman, General Scobie, and my good friend, uh, Mo Williams, that thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to speak at this event today. And I, I definitely want to echo what the boss said uh, uh, as far as what the reserves bring to the fight, especially during this time. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with, uh, with my friend and, and, and colleague, Mo Williams, again, General Lowe, and my wingman, General Scobie, to really talk about how the total force, Air Force Reserve and the Guard, are engaged globally. On average, we have about uh, 6,000 reserve citizen airmen that are deployed to support contingency, national emergency, and steady state operational missions. And just what uh, General Lowe just, just uh, spoke about, and also with the response with some of our COVID uh, operations that we're going to talk about here pretty shortly, uh, is, it, uh, is evident of that. And from the 477th Fighter Wing out at Joint Base Elmendorf uh, Richardson in Alaska, to our 446 Airlift Wing out of Joint Base Lewis McCord, who support Operation Deep Freeze, our airmen serve in every corner of the globe imaginable, supporting 11 combatant commanders, 
defending airspace in cyber domains. Reserve Airmen, we also support and provide uh, direct support to the United States Space Force. And we're gonna talk about that here in a little bit. Our Air Force Reserve space professionals conduct operations daily and serve in vital supporting roles. So saying that we are globally engaged may be, may be just a, a little bit of an understatement. Over to you, boss. Hey, that's exactly, Chief. You know, and while we're globally engaged, I also want to talk a little bit about you know, my very favorite mission, and that is uh, taking care of Americans, who uh, I always say happen to be my very favorite people. But um, taking care of Americans is a top priority for the command chief and I. And uh, when we set out the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, it really, um, uh, you know, fleshed out to be one of the most important things we were able to do throughout that crisis. It created new challenges and opportunities for us in the Air Force Reserve. And, and when the nation needed us to do it, that's what we were able to do. We were able to take care of our fellow Americans. And I think that uh, the example, both from COVID-19 and what was talked about with the, the issues we had here in the NCR, I think uh, General Lowe talked about that uh, very well. One of the things that is interesting, and we talk about access a lot to uh, you know, being able to get to our reservists, uh, we activated over 1,700 um, reserve citizen airmen right at the beginning of the support for COVID-19 operations. And so from within 48 hours of getting the notice that we had to get uh, airmen to the, the most um, you know, dangerous places that we had in New York and New Jersey, uh, we were able to do that. So 48 hours from notification we had, and which was on a Friday evening, which it always ends up that way. Uh, but Sunday on Sunday afternoon, we had a citizen airmen on the ground uh, at relieving human suffering of our fellow Americans. And that is, uh, that's huge. It was the biggest unplanned uh, mobilization we've had since 9-11. And uh, it is on demand accessibility of our airmen and the capabilities they need uh, across what we have. And there's two reasons we can do that. One is the incredible volunteerism of our, our reserve professionals. And the other thing is, is our fourth generation center, which does all the heavy lifting for getting uh, airmen where they need to get, uh, air, whether it's airlift, uh, mobilization orders, whatever they need, we can get those things done and obviously we can do it in rapid fashion. But that, that rapid uh, global mobilization capability that we have in the ARC, it is, uh, you know, that's our total force engagement uh, plan as we go forward and we use it in everything uh, that we do. If you look at global mobility, 25% uh, of all global mobility is in the Air Force Reserve. 41% is in the active component, 34% is in the guard. So you can see that the ARC makes up a lot of those things and we really have to be uh, quick, agile and capable when, we, when we're able to do that because we are such a big percentage of that. And I mentioned our air crews, not just because of it's not just the medical employment piece of it, uh, the air crews are the ones that get the people where they need to get to the, the point of greatest need. And our airlift uh, uh, forces, they answered that call across the board, uh, delivering uh, personal protective equipment. They've got testing kits and ventilators and now vaccines wherever they need to go. And that saves lives. Normally we think of ourselves as an expedition, expeditionary force where we would like to take the, the fight to the enemy and take it downrange. Um, what happens when you need to protect Americans? That's what the Guard and Reserve do. We surge to protect Americans and, res and, and, we, and we relieve human suffering of our fellow Americans and uh, no greater mission could any organization ever have. And then um, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was Uber before Uber was cool. Uh, we were able to, to get uh, C-130s and C-17s uh, going from base to base, whether it was Patrick Air Force Base, McDill Air Force Base, all the places we were picking up the medical capability and then delivering where it needed to go. Um, that is what I call uh, you know, the true responsiveness of the air reserve component that we bring. And, uh, and those uh, C-130 crews and C-17 crews just did a magnificent job. Um, and then uh, one of the neat things was after this deployment and we were getting our medical professionals and once, especially in New York and New Jersey, the medical community was able to rise up and, and start to tamp down the COVID-19. We brought back all those medical professionals to the communities they came from. Oh, by the way, we didn't take anybody out of their communities that was engaged in COVID-19 response. We, we took the people who were not engaged and that was surplus capability across the nation and we brought it to where it was needed. And then we filtered that back out to the communities where COVID hadn't hit yet. And now we have experts that are in the reserve and guard that are able to help 
those communities uh, recover as well. Uh, that is that is synergistic effect of having uh, citizen airmen and citizen soldiers in the things that we do. Um, it is strengthening our, our response as an entire nation. General and Chief, uh, what a great start uh, in my perspective. A, uh, we now have a tight total force, uh, four ship formation. So let me go on to a, another question uh, to, uh, to General Lowe and Chief Williams. And it starts with really the baseline readiness. So what is your top priority to assure readiness for citizens, first military responders, and then we're gonna talk about the reserve personnel. So General Lowe. Okay, um, so as a primary combat reserve, United States Air Force, United States Army, the National Guard stands ready to, to answer the nation's call. And, and, and I think that that's, that is the bottom line. So, so the funding and the training and the readiness levels we do are all based on the active duty. They're all based on the United States Air Force, and we are a total force. And when you look at how we respond, how we train our, our airmen, we train them under the same standards. We make them ready under the same standards of an active duty airman. There, there is no difference. And there's no difference between myself, between the reserves, and between the active component out, out there in the end. So when you see an airman out there, over, over their heart, it's the United States Air Force. And so what component they come from, quite frankly, doesn't matter. When we go to combat, when we go to war, when you think about what we did 30 years ago in Desert Storm, where we had the largest, one of the largest air forces ever, okay? We've been cut back since then. That was still a total force response. We watched as active duty, guard, and reserve airmen. So, so when you talk about the readiness level and what America brings, Realistically, we are the model for the rest of the world on how to do this correctly. And I think that that's important. So when you talk about readiness, then that's the one thing that, we, that is foundational to having a credible deterrent and a credible United States Air Force. When we go to combat, we are interdependent on each other. You know, the National Guard motto has, has been always ready, always there. And we love being first to the fight, but that's the same as an Air Force Reserve Airman. That's the same as an active duty airman, right? If the nation calls, we're going to answer that call. And so now, so now what is a little bit different about us? And, and, and I, I think that that's important for, for uh, Scobes and I and the Chiefs to, to realize. The difference is that part-time workforce, right? We have to be able to provide a resilient um, part-time workforce because that's the strategic depth the nation needs. And you already heard, heard the numbers at a fraction of the cost. Okay. So now, how do we do that? Well, it takes effort and it takes a lot of effort. Um, there's some things that are coming up like duty status reform, which takes you know disparate 26 different statuses and, and necks it down into the four primary. I mean, things like that, that help America rapidly mobilize their reserve components in order to get after this. But when we deploy, we deploy as a total force. And so, so for the readiness side of it, it's ensuring that, that federal readiness for the mission. And then it's also ensuring that we never break faith with our airmen so that they're trained and ready to go. And then the resiliency piece that their family members bring to it, family and friends, so that when they're called, like they were on January 6th, they know that that other half of their life, the employer side of it, and then their families are taken care of so they can concentrate on their mission. And that's what our, that's what our guard, our reserve partners, they've been doing that essentially for 30 years since the first conflict. And then where do we take that in the future? It's how to now do we capitalize on that great work we, we've had in order to build a much stronger Air Force and convince the American people about investing in our Air Force. And then also realizing that if you hire a citizen airman, a National Guard or Reserve member, you are part of that fabric of national defense. And so making those connections to the communities, as we, as Scobes and I do, as both chiefs, we do that all the time, is continuing those connections because it's strong and those connections are strong. So all in there. Chief Williams, your thoughts? Yes, sir. I, I think you uh, definitely hit it on the nose there. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, 
uh, sometime in the in a reserve component, we're a little more mature uh, force. And what we do, we take those civilian skill set and integrate them into those military skill sets. So at that performance level, we're already trained to the standard of our same active duty counterpart. But we take those outside skill sets of managing financial institutions, medical institutions, and that enhanced the growth when we go out there and we lead our nation. And just here within the last year, uh, in 2020, now 2021, uh, the nation is seeing what the reserve component brings to the fight. And it's like the boss said, hey, this gives them the opportunity to hire them to be great, good employees within their area and embrace the community. Because when they go out on the front lines, they, a lot of them go out on the front line within the community that they live, live in, but they also have a mission to do that they're trained and proficient in doing it. And that brings a problem, a situation where, hey, they want to embrace those individuals and let people have the right for their protests, but also be upstanding citizens within our military organization. But those assets and them being trained and proficient in taking that uh, civilian skill set, I think give us an advantage in when we go out and really hit the fight. So over to you, sir. General Scobie and uh, Chief White, uh, same question. How do you assure readiness for the reserve personnel? Sure. You know, it is uh, what is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out with kind of this overarching uh, uh, concept as we talk about the arc, which which sometimes is, is um, it, it gets muddled somewhere. There are so many things um, where uh, General Lowe and I and the command chiefs, uh, we, we have to work together on these things because there's some common um, uh, concepts that we have to uh, work within our formations and get people uh, to understand. And one of the things is we try not to put a uh, guard and reserve uh, bases close together because a lot of times we're competing for the same people uh, as we go forward. And uh, as I like to say, the guard cheats a lot because there's a lot of state authorities that they have that, that I would love to have in the reserve. But that's really an important distinction. Um, we're three components within the Air Force because they're distinct and they're separate. Now we both give surge capability. We're both an economical uh, form of, of how we produce uh, combat power for America. That is true. Um, but what you really uh, you start to tease out and look at is the very interesting um, things that the guard is able to do because of the state uh, affiliations that they have. Whereas in, in the reserve as a total federal force, we have a, a whole of the country uh, approach and you have to have both of those in order to go forward. It's, it's really important. And the Air Force Reserve has been around since uh, 1947. You know, we are, uh, we're an incredible uh, longevity uh, of people in force uh, for America. And the Guard, you know, they've only been around since you know, the 1600s. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. You know, so they, they, have a little, uh, they have a little bit on us there. And so when you look at that and how we do things, it's important uh, that we, um, we get our folks up on the step. I, I am not going to say it again because General Lowe said it exactly right. It is about having uh, your airmen that are trained at the exact same level that the active component is. And we're the only service that does that. So that when we go to war immediately, within 72 hours, <laughs> sometimes 48, you are able to get uh, airmen to where they need to be immediately. Or, or <laughs> less than a day, as, as we saw on the 6th. So uh, I'm gonna nod, I'll give you a nod on that one. It was pretty impressive. Um, but uh, that's the end of it. From now on, it's, it's, it's only talking about how great I am. But, the, um, but, I, but I'm telling you, the, these things are important. So what we've done in the reserve component on the readiness piece is we're looking at it from uh, two aspects. And it's really the individual readiness of our, our airmen. Um, we, you know, our, our equipment and our MC rates and all that, absolutely in, in, important as well. But for our airmen in COVID-19, that has been a struggle, uh, General Rayberg, as you alluded to at the beginning of the question. So what the, the command chief and I have, uh, have really focused on is how do we get, especially our first responders, how do we get them uh, to make sure that their personal readiness is, is up on point? And, and we do that twofold. One is what they're doing in their civilian jobs, because that dovetails very nicely into what they do in their military jobs. And that's always been a strength of the Guard and Reserve. And then the other piece of it is, is to make sure that we spend the days that we have with our airmen and uh, to, sh to ensure that we are getting that personal readiness uh, piece under control. We're using our fourth generation center that's uh, down with actually where the command chief now is at the uh, Air Force Reserve Command piece of it, the NACHCOM. And what we use is the fourth generation center to make sure that we get all of the uh, deliberate planning exercises done. 
And we do that in, uh, in, in conjunction with the joint force across our nation uh, to make sure that we are in, integrated into all these exercises. And we set those uh, days aside to get everybody in our annual tour to make sure that we're doing uh, re and re our readiness in this way. And it's starting, it, it's the crawl, walk, run. We start with getting exercises at the local um, squadrons. We get those together and we, uh, we build upon that with exercises that will include uh, more reserve units. And then since we're in every mission set, we're able to integrate fighters and bombers and, and tankers and transport everything we need to, not to mention uh, the cool things we do in uh, space, cyber, and, and uh, ISR, which is a phenomenal capability. And we get all that together and then br we bring it up to the national level when we, when we do national level exercises. And we do that and it's a deliberate process that we do to make sure that each uh, organization that's going out the door, we prioritize it by the folks that are going into rotational combat first. And then, uh, but we, at all times, we ensure that all of our folks are ready. And, and that's the way we, we, we go about it. Chief, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thanks, General and General Rayberg. I, I think uh, my esteemed uh, panel of colleagues have, have pretty much answered that that answer. Um, in addition to the training opportunities that the boss talked about, unfortunately, um, real world events have provided us some real time training opportunities. So if you think about the pandemic, uh, what did we deploy? We deployed a bunch of medics. If you think about the civil unrest that uh, that we went through and what we're continuing to, to battle through, what have we deployed? Um, defenders. So if you look at our portfolio uh, uh, providing uh, those resources and those capabilities, we have a large contingency of medics and defenders within our portfolio on the guard and the reserve. So then, so how do we, you know, unfortunately we, we hope that we don't get those real-time training events, but when we do, we have to be able to go into action. And I, and I think that the, uh, that the world has, has seen that, uh, what the guard and reserve bring to the fight. Chief, thank you. Uh, let me do a little change up if you don't mind, because I think this is a very important next topic especially after what all four of you talked about is really uh, the cost per effect, the value that you give to our nation uh, through our guardsmen and our reservists out there. But let's be honest, last month, the Air Force established the Office of Diversity and, Cl and Inclusion. And Chief White, I'm gonna start with you because I think this is an important uh, conversation for all four of you. So what do you hear from your team at the unit level about cultivating an equitable environment for all Department of Air Force personnel. Chief White, can you start please? Yes, sir. So thank you for that, General. So one of the things that one of the things that I am I'm proud of with the Air Force Reserve is that uh, we've been actually proactive in the area of diversity and inclusion versus being reactive. Um, we've been in some form of diversity and inclusion uh, for years with the stand up of our HRDC. And just recently, um, we've just elevated our, our uh, diversity and inclusion um, office to where our chief responds directly um, to, the, to, the, to the deputy commander. But what's, in, what's important, sir, and what I'm hearing from the field is that uh, we don't let this, this pass. So we get out and we say that we want to create an environment that everyone feels um, included, empowered, and has a, a, um, a place to, to work, live, and thrive. But at the same time, we don't always uh, put forth the resources and the efforts. So I'm glad that we've done that. And, and another thing, sir, is that um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of tough when we talk about diversity and inclusion and hey what's and, and keeping this to the to the forefront and sometimes things are tied to an emotional event so what happens when the emotions pass so if we think about the George Floyd incident and just the passion that was behind we need to make something happen we need to make change well, that wasn't the first event in our country that led up to this event and all of a sudden the country, um, a, a road into a, a sense to where we're, we're still feeling the ramifications um, for that now. And the other thing that the boss and I sometimes the feedback gets is that, hey, sir, chief, you know, we got to be careful about um, losing or offending, you know, maybe 80 percent of the population over something that maybe only impacts 20 percent of the population. 
But if you're within that 20%, you are 100% effective. So we got to make sure that um, that, that we put um, processes, programs, we take a hard look. We have to com- confront this issue um, 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 head on and make sure that we're going to make this command um, better. Hey, we're not perfect. Um, the reserve, the guard, we represent a segment of society, and we know that um, society isn't perfect, but um, we owe our airmen better, and we have to do better, and that is a commitment from the boss and I to make this command better for, for everyone, and diversity and inclusion is a significant uh, part of that. Um, Thank you. Boss or Chief Williams, I don't know if it's going over to you. I'm going to yes, throw it Thank over you, to sir. General Scobie, I'll just kind of keep it in reverse order. So General Scobie, uh, this is an important topic, diversity, equity, and inclusion, your perspectives. Well, uh, you can see why my command chief is my wingman. Holy cow. Um, uh, there's nothing I could add to that response. It is, uh, that is exactly the way we view it. And um, the only thing I'll say is, you know, when, when I came into the reserve, um, to me, it was, it, was, it was like coming home. I was valued for the uh, expertise as the best F-16 pilot in the Air Force for what I brought uh, to the capability. Of, I'll get some, uh, Wilbur is not gonna agree with me on that. But, <laughs> but I, I got, um, you know, it, you were valued for what you brought and that, that's what I want for all of our airmen. It's, we've got to create an environment where everybody feels valued for what they bring, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, and those things. And the only thing that I would add to anything the chief said is um, what, what Tim and I are gonna do is break down those barriers. Um, you know, uh, 50% of our population, now, l- there's little, little threat that anybody is going to contradict me on this, but about 50% of our population is female. Um, how many barriers to service are there for a female population? And it's, uh, it's all kinds of things. And, and we have to start knocking down those targets so that when, uh, because that is, we cannot exclude large segments of our population when it comes to building the best force we can absolutely build. So that's what we're getting after. You know, what are those things? And it, it could revolve around childcare and pregnancy and those kind of things. And Congress is helping uh, the Guard and Reserve get through these issues and try to make it more um, acceptable and more uh, convenient for people to serve because um, that's what we found. We will never compensate people uh, for the amount of blood and sweat that they put into service to their nation. That would be impossible. But what we can do is create an environment where they feel valued and capable to serve their nation. And that is what we're going to do. Command Chief, I really want to hear from you too, please. Sir, uh, one of the things we're doing within the National Guard, we currently right now, we're going through uh, what we call a unified NGB, where we're uh, we're taking the resources from our EO office on both the Air National Guard and the Army National Guard incorporated into one office uh, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're using that combined strength for Army National Guard and Air National Guard to cover throughout the, the 400,000 uh, soldiers and airmen we have in the National Guard and utilize those resources combined. And one of the key things is, you know, it, as I spoke to the uh, our Joint Diversity uh, Council the other day, I said, hey, we can come up with programs and we have training we've had in the past. And just like a fellow comrade there, Tim said, hey, a motion event happened and then we become reactive. But let's, let's, let's do this throughout our organization. And it comes down to having uncomfortable conversations to get comfortable. You know, those are some things we got to do to recognize the difference among each, each one of us. And, helps that it, that brings, you know, a power to conversations when we're having it as we put those things together. You know, one of the things being the boss say, hey, we want to build an organization, a true professional that are unbiased, respectful, disciplined, and loyal to the uh, enterprise. So that's our objective in it when we're looking at diversity. So we got to have follow through even when we have these trainings and stuff. Okay, how are we going to measure this and what are we going to see the results on the back end of it? and having that conversation once again. But uh, that's what we're doing here in the National Guard. Over to you, boss. Thanks, Chief. Oh, you bet. Hey, folks, uh, let me just start with the bottom line. The bottom line we know is that diverse teams, quite frankly, perform better. So so as we do teaming, we have to figure out how to to get the best of America. And I think 
Scobes and I, the reserves, the guard, we, we, we have a unique opportunity. And I say it, when we bring in the active duty force, it's a closed meritocracy. It starts at the bottom and builds its way up, okay? And I'll give you some barrier analysis that, that we've done here in the National Guard. Um, but the reserves and the guard can actually bring outside talent. In, and we've done that. We've, we've brought in other services. So we can actually bring it in at different levels, which helps us and, and creates uh, diversity in, in our formations, especially when we can go after some of the really, really unique talent um, in the civilian world. So it's, it's really, really uh, good for us. <laughs> Sorry. Now, the other thing is, we have a Joint Diversity uh, Quality Council, JDEC. I sit on the chair of that for, uh, for the Air National Guard, piece of that in the National Guard. And of course, we have the 54 that are out there. So we have a national strategic plan and we give all the, uh, it's actually, a, it's a checklist and the state comes up with their strategic plan that feeds into the national plan. So, so that's part of it. The other thing is the Chief the officer of the, of the United States Air Force right now that reports directly to the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief Staff of the Air Force. Uh, it's an interim one. It's Miss Tawanda Rooney. We'll have a permanent one here in one June. We're bringing them from the outside. At least that's my understanding. And, and I brought on a special assistant for diversity and inclusion that's going to report directly for her uh, in order to get after this and to make sure that the unique skills of the total force, the Guard, Reserve, and Active are in all the plans of the United States Air Force, because I do believe that's important. And it's, uh, and it's Brigadier General Chris Smokey Walker from uh, the great state of West Virginia. And, uh, and he's no stranger to, to the Pentagon and he understands what it means to, to build a diverse team. He's also our JJAC chair for mentoring. And, and so, so he goes out there and teaches other people how to mentor. And then we have to partner with the community, those diverse organizations that are out there and make it exciting for them to join the United States Air Force. Now, oh, sorry, yep. sir, go I, I, I got one last piece, and this is important because Brad Webb at AATC, remember that's the first command, right? And so I, if you get Brad up there, he can talk, I mean, way smarter than the rest of us, but he can talk how he's breaking down those barriers. We do a great job of training airmen when they go overseas and, and to understand culture. Now he's taking it to a new level of training airmen what it means to come from different parts of America. And, and it's been fascinating. And so, so we start at the bottom, we continue to grow. It's both from the top and the bottom and we'll get after it. And the biggest barrier we find, and, and I know Scove's in the same thing, the active duty is the same way. It's about the E6 level, you know, um, we're losing them. We're not, we're, not, we're not getting them above that level uh, and, and building that diverse organization. And then it's about the squadron commander level, the 0405. And so we have to figure out, and we're doing the analysis now and going back out there and, and grabbing all the data we can of saying why. And so, so as, as, we, as we do that, we're gonna find some new things. We're gonna come up, we're gonna uncover some things. It'll be very uncomfortable for some people, okay? And that's okay. And then we'll have a better team at the end. And this Air Force team will be a diverse organization looking like the rest of America. Thanks. Well, I'll beg forgiveness from the generals. Uh, I'd like to give the last word to our two chiefs. Uh, and uh, Chief White, uh, what would you leave your audience with? Your last thought, very briefly, please. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, General Rayburn, General Lowe, uh, my wingman, General Scobie, and Mo Williams, thank you for this opportunity to, to, to uh, chat here with us today in, in this forum. I just want to say hang in there with us. Uh, you can turn on the television, watch the news, and there are a thousand reasons not to serve. But if you look at what the Guard and the Reserve, the ARC is doing, there are a million reasons to serve. Hey, we were there um, since the beginning. We're going to be uh, here through the end. So um, just be patient with us, hang in there with us, and your Guard and Reserve are here to support you, and uh, thank you. Command Chief Williams, last word, please. Thanks, sir. Uh, just like to say uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today, and uh, all my counterparts uh, enjoyed every every bit of it. Hey, I would just like to say to everyone looking out there, hey, come on and join the professional arms within the uh, Guard and Reserve, and hey, like we always say in the Guard, always there and always on mission. Thanks. Well, team, I think we hit the moon and back. So thank you for this inspiring conversation and for joining us here at AFA's Virtual Aerospace Warfare Symposium.
Now for our audience, thank you for tuning in to watch this panel on the total force and worldwide engagement. Thank you.